Hello and welcome to Schizophrenia Lesson 2. In this lesson we are going to look at biological explanations for schizophrenia and that is going to include the role of genetics and neural correlates. Of course it's also going to include evaluating these two factors which we will do at the end. So before we start there is a fair amount of content and key phrases that overlap with the biological approach. If it's been a while since you looked at the biological approach and that includes things like synaptic transmission then you should find a link to those videos on the screen now and they will also appear at the end of the video. So let's make a start. When we talk about a genetic explanation for a disorder we are suggesting that the condition runs in families that it is passed from generation to generation via the transmission of genes. Biological psychologists tend to use three different types of research to investigate the impact of genes. They use family studies, twin studies, and adoption studies. And we're just going to spend a little bit of time having a look at what has been done in these areas. Family studies find individuals with schizophrenia and determine whether their biological relatives are similarly affected more than non-relatives. And as you can see by the research on the screen now, Gottesman in 1991 found that schizophrenia is more common among biological relatives of the person with schizophrenia. Twin studies are used to study the relative contribution of genes and the environment. They work by assessing the occurrence of a condition in identical twins and then comparing it to the occurrence of the same condition in non-identical twins. If identical twins have a greater concordance rate than non-identical twins, it implies a genetic cause and as you can see, that is in fact the case in research that's been conducted. And then finally, you have adoption studies, which are studies of genetically related individuals who have been reared separately. And again, you have a little bit of research on the screen for you there as well. Now, all of the research conducted here implies that schizophrenia has some genetic element to it, whether that's the fact that there's a 40% concordance rate for monozygotic twins, or whether it's the fact that six and a half percent of adoptees with schizophrenic mothers also received a diagnosis there is some evidence there to suggest a genetic link however interestingly the concordance rates don't seem to go above 50 percent and that is something that we'll use in our evaluation points and something that you should just bear in mind now our next biological explanation is neural correlates Neural correlates are structures or patterns of activity in the brain that correlate with the occurrence of a symptom. And the dopamine hypothesis is the main neural correlate that you need to know about for A-level psychology. Now, before we move on, if you'd like to pause the video and attempt to draw the mechanisms involved in synaptic transmission, then please go ahead now. It's a nice little activity just to kind of remind yourself as to what they actually are, but also you're going to need to understand these structures um, going forward, particularly for drug treatments for schizophrenia, but also for the dopamine hypothesis. So the original dopamine hypothesis was the idea that schizophrenia is caused or at least associated with an excess of dopaminergic activity, which is activity relating to dopamine, in certain regions of the brain, which is then responsible for the occurrence of positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Research then went a step further and suggested that the actual problem is the fact that people with schizophrenia are thought to have abnormally high numbers of dopamine receptors on receiving neurons. So, when dopamine is released into the synapse, it results in more dopamine binding to postsynaptic receptor sites and therefore more neurons firing. So if we put that into an example, imagine there is an increase of activity in an area linked to your auditory cortex. It would result in too many neurons firing in that area of the brain, which could then lead to the experience of auditory hallucinations, which is a positive symptom of schizophrenia. 
The dopamine hypothesis then got a little bit of an upgrade in 1991 when Davis et al. suggested that it's not just about excess levels of dopaminergic activity, it's actually more about abnormal levels of dopaminergic activity, whether those are too high or too low. For example, too much dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway, which is a reward pathway in the brain, can lead to positive symptoms of schizophrenia. However, a deficit of dopaminergic activity in areas of the prefrontal cortex, which is an area responsible for thinking and decision making, can lead to negative symptoms such as cognitive impairment or abolition. And the evidence for this suggestion comes from neuroimaging studies conducted by Patel et al. in 2010, where PET scans were used and found lower levels of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex of schizophrenics compared to a control group. Okay, so that is the end of the outline and we're now going to have a look at a couple of evaluation points. I've got four evaluation points for you, two for the role of genes and two for the role of neural correlates and that should set you up nicely for anything that the exam could throw at you. We're going to start with some support for the role of genes. Now for this point we are going to use the research studies that we talked about in the outline so we're going to refer to Gotesman from 1991 and Tianari et al from 2004. We don't have to rehash these points. We already made these points in the outline. This evaluation point is much more about summarizing the fact that there is a lot of research support for the role of genes in making people vulnerable to schizophrenia. There's also a little bit of extra evidence there, which was researched by Ripke et al. in 2014, and they conducted studies at the molecular level showing 108 different gene variations that increased the risk of schizophrenia. Okay, so the point that we're making is that these findings don't mean that schizophrenia is entirely genetic. However, it is research support for the role of genes, and it does suggest that genetic factors make some people more vulnerable to developing schizophrenia than others. Right, moving on, we have a limitation of the genetic explanations for schizophrenia, but to be fair, it's technically a limitation of the biological explanations for schizophrenia in general. Um, and that is that there is evidence to show that environmental factors also increase the risk of developing schizophrenia, but these factors are very often ignored by biological explanations. So environmental factors include both biological and psychological influences. Biological risk factors include things like birth complications and smoking THC-rich cannabis as teenagers. Psychological risk factors include things like childhood trauma, which generally leaves people more vulnerable to adult mental health problems, but there is also now evidence for a particular link with schizophrenia. There's also a little bit of research there just to back up that point which makes this evaluation point really really nice and powerful because not only have you got some descriptive bits but you've also got an actual study to back it up okay it's also a nice link with issues and debates because you can spin it as a biological reductionism point if you want to next we have research support for the dopamine hypothesis and that is, for example, that dopamine agonists like amphetamines that actually increase the levels of dopamine in the brain make schizophrenia worse and can produce schizophrenia-like symptoms in non-sufferers. Also, antipsychotic drugs, which are given to people with schizophrenia and work by reducing dopamine activity in the brain, help to reduce symptoms of schizophrenia. Furthermore, Research has also suggested that a number of candidate genes that are implicated in schizophrenia actively act on the production of dopamine or on dopamine receptors. So studies like this all strongly suggest that dopamine is involved in the symptoms of schizophrenia. And then as a final evaluation point, you have the role of glutamate. So one limitation of the dopamine hypothesis is evidence for the central role of glutamate. So for example, post-mortem and live scanning studies have consistently found raised levels of glutamate in several regions of the brain of people with schizophrenia. Also, several candidate genes for schizophrenia are believed to be involved in glutamate production or processing. 
So that means that there is an equally strong case for the role of glutamate as there is for the role of dopamine, which means that other neurotransmitters may be involved, which is obviously a limitation of the dopamine hypothesis, which suggests that it's all about dopamine. Okay, so those are your four evaluation points. You've got two for genes and two for neural correlates, which should set you up perfectly for any eventuality. Before we finish, just briefly, in an exam so far, this is the essay that's come up for this topic. Now, just because it's come up once before doesn't mean that it's not going to come up again. And also there are various different variations of this topic that they could quiz you on in an essay style question. So for example, they could get you to outline and evaluate the dopamine hypothesis for eight marks, which would be quite nice. Three mark outline, five mark evaluation, easy peasy. They could get you to outline and evaluate research into neural correlates of schizophrenia, which is effectively the same as question two. The only difference is, is that they haven't been very specific about which neural correlate. So if you've learned a second neural correlate alongside the dopamine hypothesis, then feel free to talk about that in this question. Question four, outline and evaluate genetic and neural explanations for schizophrenia for 16 marks. It's effectively the same question as number one, but they've just worded it slightly differently to catch you out. So don't panic if you read genetic and neural explanations. It's biological explanations for schizophrenia. Okay, because neural explanations are your neural correlates. And then just one final one that I thought of as I was sat here making this video outline and evaluate the dopamine hypothesis for 16 marks. Now, I'll admit, it's unlikely to come up as a 16 marker. It's a pretty horrible question, and I'm not sure whether they would ever ask you to do it. But just in case, if they do, you would have to take one of the evaluation points for the genetic explanations, which would be the biological reductionism one, and you should make that all about the dopamine hypothesis, and then together with the other two evaluation points that I gave you, that would then make up three evaluation points, which should make for a solid essay. I don't think that would come up, but I just want to have put it out there so that you've seen it, um, just to make sure that you are prepared for anything that they could throw at you. So that is the end of the video. There's been a lot of biology in there. So like I said before, click on the links that should be on your screen now and have a look at the biological approach and also synaptic transmission if you need a quick reminder of what that is. Otherwise, I hope it's all made sense. If you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. I hope it's been useful. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next one.